Island uh, in Fort Myers Beach, Florida in um, September 29, 2022. Uh, this is Hurricane Ian, uh, some more effects of the same hurricane. And this is of course another destruction, the same thing in Florida. And a part of all, in addition to all these natural phenomena that are changing, is the melting of the, glaci of the glaciers in the Arctic. And uh, here we have the shrinking of the Arctic ice, and that's not good. And uh, here is a, this is a, this is a marvelous picture. Look at this, a hundred years difference. Look at the upper part as it was in the 19th century, the lower part in the 20th century. Look at the difference. Um, and then this is in Alaska. Um, all that water you see was covered by ice, but it's no longer. And here we have the, the phenomenon of the melting of the permafrost. Uh, frozen ground that, because of the temperature, is beginning to melt. And this is a picture by NASA again. And you can see this uh, geometrical figures <laughs> and the water in between, and the whole thing is unstable. According to a study by NASA again, they project that um, if this continues to melt, you are going to have a gigantic amount of carbon dioxide escaping into the atmosphere. And this sort of carbon input is not taken under consideration in the models that the climatologists um, are bringing forth as we speak, because there's so much uncertainty. And of course, this is one of the victims. Uh, in the Sahel is the northern part of Africa. It's a gigantic area. You can put the entire United States into the Sahel. It would be no problem. <laughs> but you know, you have a, a tremendous amount of sun and temperature, heat, and that involves several countries that are impoverished and they don't know what to do. So you're going to have a massive flow of immigrants north. And here is one of them in Mali. Mali is part of the Sahel. And of course, these people, where are they going to go? They, of course, the only place to go is Europe. Go north. <clears throat> and uh, we have the effects of climate change here in India. And uh, here we have drought in the southern United States. That includes California. And look at the days from 2006 all the way to 20, um, 20, 2012, 20, yeah. You can see the increasing uh, amount of drought. And um, water, of course, is uh, life itself. There's no doubt about that. Um, and the, in California, we're especially unique in the political misuse of water. Uh, Rivers End is a fantastic documentary that I recommend all of you watch. I invited the producer of this uh, Rivers End and came to my class at, uh, when I was teaching at Cal Poly Pomona next door. And he came there, he, and of course I wrote a very lengthy article about the, this documentary. I had the transcripts, and it's, he invited a special a specialists from all over California, and they spoke about the political, the hydrological, and all the other effects of misuse of water. The net effect is that 80% of the drinking water in this country, I mean in California alone, goes to farmers farmers in the Central Valley, in Coachella Valley, and so on. This is, an, this is pictures of NASA again, of Lake Mead. Lake Mead is a gigantic repository of water from the Colorado River. And you can see that land Mead, uh, Lake Mead is shrinking. This is uh, t the year 2000. This is 203. Again, and this is the, uh, the, same, the same depository in 2000 and 2021. And here I have a picture that shows 2021 and 22. You can see the amount of the, the it's shrinking. The whole area is shrinking. Um, Lake Powell is another gigantic repository of water. And again, the same problem is uh, we have in Lake Mead. And here you can see the, <laughs> the actual effects of all this. Lake Powell, um, this is the second largest water re reservoir in the U.S. A water level in 2022 at lowest point since 1967. Uh, water at 26% capacity. And this is our irrigation in the Imperial Valley, I mean here in California. Look, just look at the human being there, the guy over there, and then look at the area. We, we have created 
literally empires of land controlled by one company or one human being, and then they have this gigantic amount of water to to water on the, the, the crops that they have to plant. And most likely the water that they use, they extract the water from the groundwater, so they deplete the aquifers that have taken millions of years to acquire this water. So that's the problem. And so even if nothing has happened, this process to continue, eventually that land has to be abandoned. In fact, the whole civilization would disintegrate because you cannot survive without water. I mean, that's... And the worst part is, a lot of that water just gets evaporated by the sun. The way that they're irrigating is inappropriate. Yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It all goes back into that. Right, and of course they call this uh, high tech. You know, you have hydrologists, you have university. About that, this is the latest way to do it. So, on. and um, so here we have now. This is a desert in California. We have an aquatic to, to heavens. <laughs> This is um, river drying up. Um, here we have a beautiful book. I mean, this guy spent I don't know how many uh, he's to write this book. And I met him the book, and I used the book any time I taught. This is a great book to give you a history of California, uh, history of the use of California. Water, the use and misuse of water in California and the politics behind it. Behind it. He's talking in a kind of a philosophical, metaphorical sense uh, that this is, um, this is like a, a, this desert has the soul of a desert and we are trying to civilize the desert <laughs> if it's possible to do that. Um, of course, this is the reality. Uh, this is an oil field, California, and California is one of the largest oil producing states in this country. And because of fracking, uh, this country has become the largest oil uh, producer and exporter of petroleum, larger than the Saudi Arabia. Um, and this is, of course, one of the victims, one of the endangered species, says Gruss. Um, I mean, th these animals, I don't know how they survive. I mean, it's just, just uh, remarkable. And of course, this is the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Um, it was created, uh, it was the, polit the, the greatest political invention in this country in the 20th century. Uh, it had to be created because the conditions of pollution in, the, in this country were horrendous. So it came out, they passed all sorts of wonderful laws in the, in the, in the 70s, and I was there, I started in 1979. And, but then slowly, after four or five years, the, the big boys of the big corporations, they noticed that, uh, you know, these people, they're regulating us, aha, uh -huh. they're regulating us, it costs us more money to produce something, and therefore they put their, their, their money into uh, lobbies, who would lobby the congressmen, the senators, and the, the senators and the congressmen would talk to the White House, the White House would talk to this appointed at EPA, that is the administrator or the assistant administrators, and if you have a petition from the industry to create another pesticide, they would say, okay, sure, fast, fast. And all this, and then, of course, the consequences would be the dangerous species threaten the contamination of our drinking water, the contamination of our food supplies with neurotoxins, carcinogens, and so on and so on. So I, I, I lived with that environment for 20 years, and um, it was not pleasant, I can tell you that. <laughs> DDT was, the, um, it was one of the greatest chemicals of that era, 1970s. It had been created uh, from the early part of the 20th century. It was approved in this country in the 1940s. And they considered it to be a magic bullet. I mean, uh, do you name it, they use it for everything. Here you are. You have little, this young children going through the forms of DDT. I mean, this is a carcinogen, this is a terrible, dangerous chemical, and yet we have to assume that when the parents allowed these children to go through, or the people on the track, they knew nothing. They thought this was perfectly normal, perfectly safe. Why shouldn't we? So the kind of mentality that we had in the, in the period of 94 and 70s. Finally, EPA finally banned it in 1972, and that was the, a death knell for the EPA, because that triggered all the reaction against the Environmental Protection Agency because of banning of DDT. The DDT. 
And here is what happened to the DDT. In fact, we are not far from LA and in the Los Angeles area, it was one of the largest factories creating DDT. Well, they had the tremendous waste of DDT. And what do you think they did? They took the DDT and dumped it in the harbor of LA, plus in Catalina Island, and just tremendous contamination. And thanks to this professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara, um, uh, Valentine, um, he discovered this accidentally. And uh, he, I have been in touch with him and I use him in my book. He's just accidentally, he said he discovered all this. And they figured that there may be as many as 25 million boxes, I mean, barrels of DDT waste spread all over Southern California. How many generations would take to, for this to go away? I don't know. And here is the greatest victim of all this stuff is this California condor. And uh, it, it, it came to the point that there were only 27 of these birds alive. Finally, the state of California with a private um, environmental group, they, they began to feed these birds to multiply them. And the last the thing I remember is about 550 uh, birds. Here is how they. In 2006, I wrote this book just to inform the people that this idea of the, the larger the better is really the wrong way to go. Because the more, the larger the farmer, the farm, and the more power the farmer has, the less attention will pay to this kind of consequences of what he does. Spraying of chemicals that he shouldn't spray, the treatment of workers, and so on and so on. Uh, and uh, part of this, of course, you have the, 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 our tendency to eat a lot of meat. So we have all these animals that we kill every year in order to eat them. And in this country, we kill about 9 billion animals to eat them for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And here is a picture I took in the Central Valley. And you can see how they feed the animals. And these animals have nothing else to do except to eat. Keep eating day and night. Here is a picture from China. Chinese are in the United States eat tea. <laughs> and whenever I went to China and all I spoke to Chinese professors, I said to them, why do you do what we do? He said, what do you think we studied? We studied at the University of Illinois, at Wisconsin, at Stanford, and so on. And we learned this and we thought this was the latest science. So we apply that. And here is the result. Here is the result. And of course the slaughterhouse. And the birds, wildlife, wildlife, are not immune to all this in the environment. They, they suffer similar diseases that we do, cancer and all sorts of other problems. Um, and this is um, my <laughs> first exposure to this uh, global warming. This is 1989. I was at EPA, but they have sent me to teach at Humboldt State University in Northern California. And I focused on climate change when I was teaching. So I wrote this article for the Chicago Tribune. And it caused me a hell of a trouble. They tried to fire me. The only reason they didn't fire me was because I knew the administrator. And I went to the administrator, he said, forget it. Nothing will happen, and nothing happened. But nevertheless, the, uh, the immediate supervisors I had, they were in uh, cahoots with the, with the chemical industry, and, they were, and I found a letter of reprimand on my desk. And the letter of reprimand in the federal government is the step number one before they fire you. <laughs> anyway, this is part of the experience. <clears throat> so, climate chaos or climate change, is anthropogenic, that is, it's, it's part of our own doing business as humans. It's destructive effects of uh, harming the entire planet. Warming from the August, this is a warning from the August uh, 9, 2021 report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is um, the highest authority within the United Nations getting and studying the, the climate and publishing a report every year. And uh, here is, we have the meeting um, in um, England, and we have President um, Biden giving his speech. And he was a very eloquent and uh, defending and uh, saying what we have to do to work against climate change and so on and so on. But regrettably, he forgot all the promises he made when he was running for president. And not only that, but he opened the land that belongs to all of us, that is the national parks, and, um, and he 
allowed these people to begin to do fracking and extracting of this uh, fossil fuels from federal land, which is, to me, it was one of the worst things he ever did. Uh, here we have uh, saying similar things, uh, making promises that by, by 2060, China will have taken care of everything. Uh, the problem I see with that is that conflicts with the Chinese effort to talk about ecological uh, civilization, and in fact, we don't know what the Earth will look like in 2060. I mean, after all, the United Nations Secretary General, he speaks, he says we have to get rid of half of what we earn today by the end of this decade, not uh, 1960. Hey, here it is, here it is. The UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, warned uh, the world is headed to a catastrophic 1.7 degrees Celsius, and this is from September 21, 2021. Um, this is protest during the same international summit on climate, uh, and of course, <laughs> it's true, blah, 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 blah. These prime ministers and presidents got to get, get together and they begin to congratulate each other and they promise things, but they never deliver. So it's blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> And say stop funding fossil fuels. And guess what they do? Here is the IMF telling you that they are funding, they are supporting the fossil fuels at the tune of seven trillion dollars in 2022. Seven trillion dollars. This is government money to these companies to continue to do what they do. And look at the, the slide from 2015 to 2022. I mean, it's just mind-boggling. And then another subsidy is in the form of water. In order to do fracking, you need a lot of water. And here is an example. 1.5 trillion gallons of water used for fracking in this country since 2010. 20, yeah. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Meanwhile, the specific little island is going under, 2022. and. Uh, the young people, of course, at the UN Climate Summit in Egypt uh, last um, November, and he said, don't fail us. <clears throat> um, so we need to stop <laughs> making war against nature. On February 6, 2023, Antonio Guterres urged the leaders of the world to end the merciless, relentless, senseless war on nature. And he's right. I love this guy. He's really the best uh, politician I have come across in 50 years. I mean, he's really telling the way this, and for that reason, I have a tremendous respect for him. Um, and this is, of course, a picture I took of in China. And you, you can see that China is still in deep, deep trouble from pollution because they have a gigantic population, they have a gigantic industry, and they have become the workshop of the world. They produce just about everything. Um, I was in Athens, um, not this year, but three years ago, and I was trying to buy something to put my computer. So I went to a place to buy it, and it was imported from China. And I said, look, I love the Chinese, I have been to China, but what about you making it here? He said, no, 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 you can't compete with the Chinese. <laughs> I mean, this is, this, is the, this is the reality. And here's a picture I got from the New York Times about the, the largest carbon polluting steel factory in China. Um, and now, of course, some more protests. Uh, in 2020, we have all this inferno in Europe. Here in, in the United States in 2022, it was like an inferno. Um, and, uh, you know, America is warming. Ah, this is very, very important. Please pay great attention to this. Uh, I got this quote from a, a draft uh, report that has yet to be made public by the U.S. government. And look what they say. He thinks Americans value most are at risk. More intense extreme events and long-term climate changes make it harder to maintain safe homes and healthy families. Reliable public services, a sustainable economy, thriving ecosystems, and strong communities. 
the United States, yeah, has warmed, this is the key, the United States has warmed 68% faster than, than Earth as a whole over the past 50 years. Unbelievable, unbelievable. And then you hear former President Trump and all the, excuse me if any of you are Republicans, most of the Republican members of Congress say there's no global warming at all, not zero. What do you mean? You hear this. <clears throat> July, of course, this July of this year was the hottest July ever. And here is in its reflection by NASA. All the red you see is from all over the world in July of this year. And, uh, and I'm going back to Greece and some of the fires, they started seriously in 2007. You can see most of Peloponnesus is burning and that big island over there is Evia. You can see, I mean, if the satellite could see all this stuff. And here's a burning of the, the fire this year in July 27. This is from the village, in a village in Rhodes, in the island of Rhodes in July 27. And uh, here are the victims of the fire. These are the <laughs> internal refugees after a big fire. And uh, here you have a tragedy. These two women are trying to save sheep from being burned up. Um, and th here are, these are hives, um, honeybee hives are already on fire, you can imagine. You see the, on the left is the Parthenon, and you can see the fire on the right. So you could see fire approaching Athens, the center of Athens. This is, of course, in August 2023. I was there in June and July, early July. And uh, here is in, in northern Greece a gigantic fire. The largest forest the country had was burned to, to, to smithereens. Now, who set it on fire? Or was it accidental? I don't know. But it's, it's horrendous. Now we go to the Amazon, see the fires on the tree top of the trees, a protest against the fires in the Amazon, uh, again fires, and this is in Australia. Uh, and look at this picture. This is a, a classic picture that shows the depravity of our age. Look at this. They go and smash and cut down a whole forest, and you have this uh, wild creatures, wild animals um, being <laughs> completely destitute. And this is a fire that came pretty close to, to our house in Clermont. I took this picture from Clermont. This is, I, I went out of my house and I took this picture. And the picture was 23 miles away. I mean the fire, excuse me. And here is fire in California. And here, you know. Oh gosh, American West. This is from David Wallace, who also of the New York Times. He's talking about the menacing, the, the threat of, um, of smoke, and um, I have the a picture I took of this. I was for a conference in San Francisco. Here's my picture. You can see the the bridge almost disappearing from that kind of smoke. I was behind the car. I stepped. I went into the middle of the street and I took the picture. Look at this. <laughs> I mean, this is this is not a joke at all. But it's uh, um, so here on the right side you have the windmills. Uh, which are gigantic, almost 100 meters or more machines. This is wind. I mean, it's just, uh, okay, wind, we need to use the wind. But why do the engineers design these monsters? Why do they kind of design a machine that is smaller and protective of the birds? Have a, if you're a flying bird and you go there, you're not going to see the, um, the, these handles go like this. They move so fast, you're going to go there and be sliced to death. And then below the bridge, of course, you have the, auto, the highways, the, the automobiles. And they're both machines that we, that is humans, design without really much thought about the consequences. Ecological, political, moral, and so on. And uh, here's a girl. <clears throat> Planet over profit. Ah, what a wonderful idea. And of course, this is the, the war in, uh, in the Ukraine. The war in the Ukraine is not only you, people can agree and disagree as to who is right and wrong, but in my perspective right now is that war exacerbates climate change because the, the military is not exactly ecological. <laughs> they are there to blow things up or to kill people. So the machines that they use produce a lot of 
gases that contribute to global warming and therefore they diverse also resources from global warming to this so Biden instead of fighting a war against nature I mean against climate change he's fighting a war in the Ukraine against Russia which is loaded with nuclear bombs so it's it's an extremely dangerous situation that's that's the only thing I can say um, and uh, when you have in the alternatives when we put solar panels this is not the way to do it this is the way to do it. This is my house, and I put this immediately. This is a half of what I have on the roof of my house, and I did it in 2009 when I bought the house. The first step we do is immediately put solar panels, and I haven't spent a dime for electricity since 2009. I mean, it doesn't take a PhD to figure that out. I mean, this is, it produces electricity for my house, and we have a small electric car, and we plug it in, and I mean, I wish I had money also to buy the batteries. <laughs> I haven't yet. Um, <clears throat> now, this is a picture from downtown Clermont, and I want you to see the roofs of the government building that we have, the government of Clermont, zero solar panels. I went there personally and I spoke to them. I wrote them a letter describing the situation. We need to be a paradigm, an example for the rest of the community around here. We also have four colleges and a university. None of them have done this, not have done, have put solar panels on the roof. And in this case, I, I, must, I must argue, and I hope you, you don't think I'm too biased against them. I taught at Pizza College for a while. Anyway, they have, they have the money. They are rich private schools. So why don't they spend the money to put solar panels over the roof? Or why doesn't our government here in Clermont do the same thing? These are philosophical questions for you to... Sorry? Maybe it's messing with the... Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something silly like that. Yeah, you're right. And here is in this country. I mean, in this in this state, uh, they decided last year to restrict the benefits for solar panels. Why? Why would the government not do some, something like this? And here is, of course, I get back to Monk. This guy, he. Um, how to put it? He's a very interesting guy. He said he did this painting in 1893. 1893, Norway. Now, why would he create something like this? And from reading about him, what it comes out is that he did it to express his revulsion towards what we do to the natural world. He was not referring to global warming then. He was referring to the tremendous abuse of nature in fishing, in industry, and all this. So this is his protest against what we do to the natural world. And now, 130 years later, it's almost like he did it yesterday. And to me, this picture tells much more for climate change than anything else I have ever seen. It just, I love it. I mean, I don't I love it, yes. But it, it does, to me, it's, it's a kind of a philosophical attraction to it because that's how I feel about what's happening and what's likely to appear manifest in a few years. We're moving slowly towards this kind of a catastrophe. And now, this is a good, a good uh, this was an essay in the New York Times, and in this uh, lengthy article they tried to summarize what is positive happening in this country. They said the United States is leading the way for fossil fuel, again, from away from fossil fuels, and they mentioned the, the drop of, of, of price to buy solar panels, um, the, price, the drop in electricity that comes out of uh, wind, and so on. And these are all fantastic. The number of cars that we have, 20% of all our automobiles are electric cars. This is a positive, 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 very much positive. So I love it, and it's good. But considering what the, the U.S. government is saying about uh, that this whole country is warming at 68% faster than the Earth, I mean, to me, that, that is really mind-boggling. Why would this country, and I mean, I, maybe I can speculate and say it's warming faster because we have so many more cars, and not only many more cars, but larger cars. I take a walk every day, and sometimes I bike, and I can see the cars. They are large, gigantic cars. And you have a woman or a man driving a car, maybe a couple of hundred, 150 pounds, 200 pounds at the most, and the car itself probably weighs several thousand pounds, right? I mean, why? Why would any manufacturer create this kind of gigantic cars? And of course, the pollution will be several times larger or more than, than the small cars, and so on. And um, now, I bring you the Pope. <laughs> 
you know, I, I'm not a Christian Catholic. I mean, I, but I like this guy. I really do. Look at this, what he's saying. He just said it this month, October 4th, 2023. He speaks like a scientist. He really does. I mean, there are a tremendous number of footnotes. If you read it, it's a very lengthy article. It's 7,000 words, and you can find it on the internet. Just type the name of the Pope, Pope Francis, and then uh, praise God. It's the, the title of his uh, encyclical or letter. And he's just a great guy. I mean, he, he has the scientific literature in his fingertips, and he's telling you what's happening. And he's, of course, very not satisfied with what we do. And he's very concerned because the next, the, the international meeting about climate will take place in, in, the, um, in, the, in the Gulf states, and because they're petroleum state, petroleum, this is, uh, I think, Dubai. And because Dubai is making its living out of selling petroleum, maybe Dubai either influence or bribe the United Nations to allow the conference to take place in Dubai. I don't know. I'm simply speculating. So I congratulate the Pope for this. And In fact, I'm writing an article about the Pope right now. <laughs> and finally, this is my conclusion. And this is, you know, a conclusion in terms of like a pies in the sky. I mean, what you expect to do. I would like to see the disappearance of solar of um, fossil fuels. I'd like to see the disappearance of nuclear weapons and all sorts of good things to and the, 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 the again large cities have to be to rethink and redesign themselves to become more humane and more a smaller and, and human scale so that people can begin to know each other and begin to practice some kind of democracy, that sort of thing. And so it's just my own ideas. <laughs> and with that, I thank you very much, and I'd like to have the opportunity to, to have a discussion with you. Questions for Ed? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, <coughs> Art, okay. Uh, uh, sir. Uh, essentially, you are uh, advocating a Green Party uh, policy. Why do not Green Parties do better? In the U.S., they're kind of zero. In Europe, they kind of are small, mm -hmm. but they still aren't very powerful. Well, it seems to me the Green Party here, we, we had the experience of Raffinader, remember? He ran and he probably caused the presidency to Al Gore, who is definitely, he was a very good man. And he, and to this very day, Al Gore is working on climate change. And I listened to him not long ago in a video with the New York Times. And he was talking about this corruption I referred to and so on. So he would have been much better president than, say, George W. Bush. <laughs> I mean, George W. Bush, he destroyed the Middle East. To me, it's pure, I'm a historian. And I was observing what was going on in the Middle East, and I, I remember what, what the Mongols did in the 13th century. Believe me, there was a Greek historian who described the Mongol impact on the Europe. He said it was like a frozen river that went down and wiped out the Middle East. All the libraries that have survived, the books, they burned them down. They did horrendous destruction, just like the early Christians did in ancient Greece. Same destruction. So um, I think the Green Party doesn't have a chance because the two big parties, the, the, the Republicans and, the, and, the, and the, the, Republic, the Republicans and the Democrats, are like the, the two different sides of the same coin. The Democrats are usually for war. The Republicans are for money, primarily for money. <laughs> and nuclear bombs and bases all over the world and so on and so on. So the Green Party it should be, rather than the Green Party, I would love to see all the environmentalists to get together to work together and fight this cause. This is a life and death cause. Rather than focusing on pesticides or on the winds or anything else, get together and try to convince the, the, the congressmen and senators that this is life and death struggle. This is not a, another big problem. It's much bigger than a big problem. It's gigantic. It's, that's why I use the word tragedy and I use the word tri cosmic. Cosmic meaning encompassing, ecumenical, global, you know. Uh, that's, that's basically why I think that's the case, that uh, the Green Party doesn't have much of a chance in this country. Though I would love to see a Green Party. 
<laughs> I mean, frankly, we should have a party. We live in the United States, we should have an American party. And forget the Republicans or the Democrats or the Greens or anything. A party that would be for the best interests of this country. And the best interests, of course, under the rule of law and justice and equality, not just to protect the interests of the, of the billionaires. I mean, I have also written about that. A billionaire is an antithesis of any democracy. You cannot have billionaires and call yourself a democrat. It's out of the question. The Greeks spoke about it two and a half thousand years ago. It's true today. A couple more questions, maybe? Yes. May I? Yes, yes. Uh, throughout your presentation, you mentioned the threat of uh, fossil fuels and, and then uh, uh, <clears throat> the uh, environmental friendly source of energy as an alternative. But I don't, think, I don't recall that you mentioned anything about the, uh, using uh, atomic energy as an uh, alternative source. What, 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 what's their, what, what, what's their uh, uh, position of the, the environmentalist uh, on that? On the atomic energy. Oh, nuclear energy, energy. Nuclear energy. Nu nuclear energy. You know, nuclear energy is a result of nuclear bomb. So the stuff that causes the nuclear bomb causes also electricity. Yeah, I, I, I know that. Okay, well that's the, that's the only reason I have in mind that I'm against it. Because it's a, it's a technology that is beyond the control of human beings. A nuclear bomb is, is obliterating everything. It makes you a dust. <laughs> it just doesn't kill you, it makes you dust. You don't exist. So you cannot expect human beings with limited knowledge and limited ability to control this, this massive energy and massive power. So for that philosophical reason, I'm against nuclear power plants. I'm against nuclear weapons. So we have one or two more questions, maybe? I, I have a response. Yes. Well, I, my stomach was thrown on when I was watching you know, your presentation. I want to thank you, thank you, really, to bring these, you know, these pictures and the facts to our face. And I must say that I, in 1992, I had three dreams. The third dream, three dreams, the third dream was what I saw, those photos, like you are taking, you have taken, all around the world, burning, burning. And, and I also feel that, you know, I probably have contributed to this by being, you know, in China, helping the U.S. companies to do business and brought their technology to China. And now I want to work together with you and bring a reverse of that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank My you. pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. I hope we have enough time to to stop this. And really, this needs everybody to stand up. Because this is our home. This is really, it's going to burn. I see, I saw it in 1992 in my dream. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Thank, you. Thank you. One more question and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, there's a, uh, he, he, didn't you ask? I, I did. Yeah, yeah. Just very quickly, um, you mentioned about windmills. You had a negative reaction to windmill farms. And I know the US, especially Europe, is building a lot of windmills uh, in order to generate electricity. So Turbines, yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I, I think it's a bad idea to, f I mean, it's a good idea to use the wind as a form of energy, but I would urge the engineers to redesign that, concept, that machine so that it protects the flying birds. Flying birds that cannot see the fast moving. So you have a lot of birds that actually are sliced to death by these machines. So, and then also they should be put in places where they are not, let's say, in archaeological size, they are not out in the water, in the ocean. <laughs> now, I read yesterday that the University of Maine, in Maine, they are designing a whole system of these turbines to put them in water and then get the electricity. But of course, the people close to the water are very much against it because they don't want to look at these abominations. <laughs> they are over 100 meters tall. So they are talking about gigantic machines. And to the amount of money for the investment to creation of these machines must be quite, quite enormous. So it's a beautiful idea to use the eolic or the wind power, but you have to, you the engineers, you ought to think to redesign this machine and make it more tolerable and appealing, in fact.
All right, let's thank Ev one more time. Come on up here. Thank you. Uh, presentation and on behalf of the club, I would like to thank you for your presentation. Get our thank you. <laughs> Three, two, one. Nice. One more time. <laughs> Just in case your eyes were closed. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, um, so there will be a program.